I want to invite you all to try something. Upturn the corners of your mouth, crinkle the edges of your eyes, and part your lips. Make the ever so familiar gesture of a smile. The same expression that spreads across your face as you look back fondly on photos from your past. As you giggle with friends after a long and exhausting day, or as you beam at an achievement you're proud of. But even now, sitting here in the chapel pews, how does it feel to form a smile without reason? Hi, my name is Amber, and as I'm told, you might know me as that cheery, smiley girl with the hairband, the one who is always happy, or so it may seem. Today, I want to share with you my tumultuous journey with happiness and the lessons I've learned as a result of this struggle. What I believe to be a framework to living a happy life. It all started in the backyard of my childhood home, where my grandma often told me to stand outside on my tiptoes while reaching my arms up towards the sky and laugh. As a child, believing my grandmother to be all-knowing, I simply followed what she said. I stood there, stretched out, and let out a little giggle. She would tell me to laugh even louder, and then she even joined in. At first, my laughter was clearly forced, a few skeptical chuckles here and there. But watching my grandma's laughter was so silly that my own laughter began to precipitate from genuine amusement. I can't even begin to wonder what our neighbors thought of us in those moments, manically laughing in broad daylight. Later, I asked my grandmother, what is the point of all of this? Why choose to laugh or exhibit joy if there was nothing funny about the situation? The stretching, that was anything but amusing and quite straining even over a few minutes. So why laugh? Well, first she told me that standing on my tiptoes would make me taller. And second, that laughter, even if it's fabricated, can make one happy forever. Clearly, the first one didn't work out. But I've always been curious about the latter point. Could fabricated laughter really elicit genuine amusement? And more broadly, could joy and positivity, even if manufactured, make one a happier person overall? It turns out that what my grandma was really trying to teach me was a practice called laughing yoga, an ancient technique from India that involves a series of breathing and stretching exercises and cued laughter. The movement has taken off in the West as well. And in the early 2000s, laughing clubs became a big trend all over the United States and Canada. The idea of these exercises is to help you deal with stressful situations by promoting optimism and positivity and by releasing endorphins and hormones like dopamine and serotonin. Many researchers believe that the body cannot distinguish between fake or real laughter. So perhaps even forced laughter is a catalyst for real joy within us. That's quite powerful. If laughter creates joy, could this apply to other emotions as well? Does a frown then make one immediately sad? Or could intentionally furrowed eyebrows stir feelings of anger? These are questions that scientists have pondered for decades. What comes first, the feelings or the expressions? One theory is that physiological responses our physical reactions to situations determine our emotional responses. 
Meanwhile, others believe that facial changes caused by an emotional response results in further stimulation of that emotion. So if you're happy, you smile. And then the act of smiling augments your initial feelings of joy. There's a really interesting study where participants hold a pen in their mouths while watching cartoons. One group is told to hold the pen between their teeth, while the others hold a pen between their lips. Participants who had the pen between their teeth reported enjoying the cartoons more and laughed much more often than those who held the pen between their lips. What an odd study. Why could this possibly be the case? It's because holding a pen between teeth is a similar physical expression to smiling, and holding it between your lips mirrors a frown. The very act of tensing the facial muscles associated with a smile increased overall enjoyment and pleasure. So it's pretty interesting that the body does not know we are faking it. But does that mean all it takes is a forced smile or spontaneous giggle to uplift ourselves? If everyone constantly kept a pen between their teeth to hold a permanent smile, which sounds absolutely horrifying, would that lead us to an eternal state of happiness? Learning from the somewhat ridiculous laughing ritual of my childhood, I've always been drawn to this powerful, joyful expressions. It has brought about my habits of beaming and skipping through the school halls, indulging in frequent humorous laughter with friends, and smiling even in the face of any negativity that surrounds me. When we wore masks during COVID, this habit even transformed into the ever so charming smizy. The need for positive connection taught us all to smile with our eyes. Even now, it seems that nothing is more energizing than a reciprocated smile. In fact, as someone recently pointed out to me, over the last few years, my disposition towards positivity has become so deeply ingrained that I even laugh when I cry. My fixation on happiness peaked as I moved to Appleby in grade 11. Disoriented by transformative changes in my personal, academic, and social lives that year, like many new students, I felt utterly lost the first few months of school. At a time where I could not rely on any external influences at home or at school to make myself happy, my predisposition to force a smile emerged as a valuable tool and perhaps a necessary coping mechanism. I woke up each morning with the positive conviction that each day would be exciting and special, and that regardless of what happens, I convinced myself and accordingly convinced everyone around me that my resting state was happiness. That sounds like quite a foolproof strategy, doesn't it? That despite absolutely anything in the world, all it takes is to fake it till you make it and convince yourself to remain happy? However, like most things in the world, it is never that simple. And behind such a narrative is a double-edged sword. Just because one can manufacture joy for themselves, should they? Hedonic relativity. It's a concept in psychology that suggests that happiness is relative to a baseline. And any states above or below this baseline that correlate with joy or sadness are only temporary. Hedonic adaptation then tells us that our emotional baselines are mobile and adjust according to our circumstances. You can see this manifest in your own life as you get excited at a good grade, win the finals of a sports tournament, or get into your dream university. And the same even goes for people who win the lottery. 
after the initial state of excitement, these changes eventually become normalized and our neutral baselines adjust to account for our new standards. So then what does it mean to be in a constant state of happiness? You only know happiness because you know what it feels like to not experience happiness. If you constantly mask your true emotions with a smile and force yourself to be happy, that just becomes a neutral and numb state. In aiming for constant happiness, I've trained my hedonic baseline to readjust. If happiness is relative, then being constantly happy means that you are never actually happy. It's the concept that light cannot exist without darkness. Happiness as a concept cannot have any meaning without sadness. And then at times where things may go unexpectedly or one becomes tired of putting on a positive facade, even the slightest bit of discontentment can become overwhelming. Here's a thought experiment with something much more ta tangible that we all seem to understand, money. Let's suppose you win $1 million. Great, I know. Well, just a few days later, you suddenly lose 600,000, leaving you with only 400,000 to yourself. After your lucky initial win, you'll feel elated, but it'll feel really sad to lose such a big amount. Conversely, suppose you win 100,000 with no caveat. You'll feel all the happiness of gaining so much and feel no sadness because you get to keep all of it. In the first scenario, you're conditioned to a state of having a lot of money. So a huge loss feels really impactful. So even when you end up with 400,000 after the loss, you'll feel more sad than if you just gained the 100,000 without any loss. Well, I'll have you know, for a while, I considered myself a millionaire. Delusional, I know. Anyways, in conditioning myself to remain at a constant state of contentment, it's the same feeling as the initial elation of a big lottery win, where any loss or sad event made me feel incredibly overwhelmed. And now we can all see that for a very long time, my notion of happiness was misconstrued. What gives short-term joy becomes incredibly unsustainable in the long run. I'm sure many of you know the movie Inside Out, somewhat of a classic of our time, where the protagonist Riley's emotions are personified and given emotions of their own. Riley finds herself disoriented by the changes of moving cities and growing up. And she learns to put on a brave face and happy expression for her parents and friends as she navigates the societal pressures of what it means to be okay. And all of us are not eschewed from these same pressures. Why must we smile for photos or be inclined to tell others we feel good when asked how are you? and put on masks of contentment in public. On one hand, there is the internal pressure of self-preservation to constantly pursue joy despite any negative circumstances around you. And all the while, external factors add to the notion of toxic positivity. The idea that to be okay and to function in a normal society, we need to be content. In Inside Out, Joy tries to overshadow all of the other emotions, causing their imaginary world to crumble into pieces from the imbalance. And it's not until the very end where all her emotions are enabled to coexist that Riley is left at her most authentic state. She embraces vulnerability. As one of my favorite movies, 
this story perfectly encapsulates the hedonic adaptation model. The key to a fulfilling life is emotional balance and authenticity. In allowing ourselves to experience a range of emotions that deviate both above and below our baseline, happiness no longer feels neutral, but is rather an energizing and novel sensation. On my path to reading more about the topic of happiness, I came across Aristotle's philosophy of hedonic versus flourishing happiness, a view that I've come to resonate with. Hedonic happiness appears to be the modality of happiness many of us understand today, seeking a pleasurable rush and promoting the presence of positive outcomes and the absence of negative ones. Meanwhile, flourishing happiness is not a fleeting state of stimulation or excitement, but rather a virtue of self-realization and finding meaning. Aristotle describes flourishing happiness as eudaimonia, a Greek word meaning true self. Genuine eudaimonic happiness requires authenticity and vulnerability, and real long-lasting happiness does not imply being constantly happy. In my opinion, a lack of flourishing happiness, a lack of pursuit of eudaimonia, is one of the biggest consequences of our fast-paced society. With the constant search for instant gratification, like doom scrolling on Instagram or TikTok, I'm looking at all of you. As a result of this reliance on that single rush of dopamine, many of us have become unable to be happy from within, to sit down, read a long novel, or to simply think and reflect on ourselves. At the end of the day, I am by no means the sage of happiness. Finding true fulfillment is a journey that is nuanced and personal. And my purpose is to simply inspire you to think for yourselves and perhaps use my story as guidance. For me, my quarrel with happiness, from manic laughing sessions in the backyard to falling down a rabbit hole of manufactured positivity, and now to my current state of self-reflection. It has taught me to embrace vulnerability and to understand that every single one of my emotions are equally important. When I need a rush of elation, yes, a smile or laugh can always do the trick. But the toxic positivity of joy no longer overshadows everything else. There is authenticity and there is balance. And while I've learned to be genuine in my emotions, my journey towards happiness is far from over. Next comes the notion of acceptance, the fact that it's okay to be happy and it's okay to be sad. As the year comes to a close, and each one of you venture into the next chapter in your lives, whether it is going to university or simply starting your next year of high school, keep in mind that whether, keep in mind that change comes with its own struggles and adjustments for everyone. If you ever need a little spark to brighten up your day, share a smile with someone around you. But most importantly, Stay true to yourself and your emotions. Allow yourself to be vulnerable and authentic in the way you feel. Enjoy short-term pleasures and joy, but rather than mere hedonism, seek flourishment and fulfillment. Seek eudaimonia. And one way you could make me truly happy right now is to one, wish my mom a happy birthday on the way out if you see her. And two, please stand and sing hymn number 656. Six.
And also a reminder from Miss Choi to remember that we sing verses one and two plus three and four in succession before going on to the refrain. Thank you.